All right, time for bacteria. So kingdom monera are all prokaryotic, which means they have no nucleus, no membrane bound organelles. And they're divided into four subgroups, eubacteria, cyanobacteria, archaeobacteria, and prochlorobacteria. So eubacteria, true bacteria, are the ones we hear about the most, E. coli, etc. They have cell wall, cell membrane, and some have flagella, some are photosynthetic, which means they don't need food and instead just use light and uh, carbon dioxide. They live in soil, water, and inside larger organisms, such as um, E. coli living in our digestive tract. Cyanobacteria, uh, blue-green algae, are photosynthetic. They live in freshwater, seawater, and on land throughout the world. Some can survive in really hot water, and some can survive in Arctic snow, so they're a really um, ranged organism. Archaeobacteria live in extremely harsh environments, such as oxygen-free oxygen thick mud and digestive tracts of animals, called methanogens, methane producers, and they live in really salty areas, so high places with high salinity content that they might not be isotonic to, or might have been adapted to. Prochlorobacteria are newly discovered, and all we know is that they're photosynthetic. There's two species of them only. Eubacteria are the smallest living cells, ranging from 1 to 10 micrometers. That's really, really small. So they're pro prokaryotic and they have a cell wall cell membrane. So this is the capsule. The cell wall outer layer, layer pepto peptidoglycan cell wall, uh, sorry, cell membrane, and the cell wall. And then they have pili or pillus, which are capable of transferring genetic material um, in binary fish. No, not binary fish. It's the um, sexual reproduction of bacteria, but we'll come to that later. They have 70S ribosomes as opposed to 80S ribosomes in uh, eukaryotes. And what's really important is this is the Svedberg unit of size. And IB wants you to know the S stands for Svedberg units of size. 70S in ribosomes because they're smaller, 80S in eukaryotes. The nucleic acid core, aka the nucleoid region, is the naked like area where DNA is stored and they have a cytoplasm. So in some bacteria, the nucleic acid is ring-shaped, called plasmids. So there's three basic shapes, and from these shapes, you can infer the bacteria. You have cocci, hehe, <laughs> coccus, hehe, <laughs> singular, rod, shape for bacilli, and their name bacilli, I mean, spiral, spirilla. So um, this is something like staphylococcus bacteria, um, bacilli, spirilla. And they can, change, they can arrange themselves in pairs, clusters, or long chains. So they can be either of these three shapes, and then they can also arrange themselves in a diplo, staphylo, or strepto shape. Strepto and staphylococcus are both real. Um, and they usually reside in your throat, and strept throat comes from streptococcus bacteria. Um, they are classified as gram-positive or gram-negative, which means they're... There's a technique called gram staining where they are stained with bacteria and whether they have a one layer or a second layer of cell walls uh, can be determined by the staining from the, by this dye called um, crystal violet dye and saffronine. So crystal violet dye will show up for gram positive bacteria and they will look purple. That means they have one thick layer of CHOs, which are uh, carbohydrates and proteins. But gram-negative, they have a second layer of pepti peptidoglycan, second thinner layer, uh, made of lipids and carbohydrates instead of proteins and carbohydrates, which absorbs saffronine, this is pink-red dye. So some bacteria can uh, achieve locomotion through the flagella, and others don't even move at all. Um, they're found almost anywhere. Continuity or reproduction. Some reproduce very, very rapidly, like even like as fast as once every 20 minutes, mean, meaning they double every 20 minutes. They have an optimum temperature range at 25 to 38 degrees Celsius. They reproduce through binary fission, conjugation. This is the, conju this is the one. Uh, binary fission, conjugation, and spore formation is not necessarily reproduction, but a way for them to preserve themselves for later reproduction. So binary fission is asexual. So this, is, this means they can achieve it themselves, they can do it themselves. Uh, DNA consists of one long-stranded chromosome, but not really. The chromosome replicates and the bacterial cell will just split in half, so like cytokinesis. And the cell splits and they both have identical DNA. So conjugation is a primitive form of sexual reproduction, meaning that you need a 
you need a partner to achieve uh, to be able to conjugate. Two cells will lie side by side. One cell becomes the donor, which is the male, and one cell is the recipient, the female. And a long, thin protein bridge, the pi pillus. So the earlier, they're not just used for movement. The pillus also can transfer uh, genetic material. Will transfer all their DNA from the donor to the recipient. The donor will die, and the recipient will undergo division. So you have two cells, one dies, and you get a new cell. So new cells are not produced, but instead new new cells that are like the cell that is replaced has DNA contributed by two different bacteria, which allows for genetic diversity. So that's why this is an important process, even though new cells aren't necessarily created. Spore formation. In certain bacillus bacteria, they survive harsh environmental conditions through spore formation, called an endospore. So uh, it kind of looks like this taco sushi burrito thing. The, there is a thick internal wall enclosing the DNA in the cytoplasm, and it's able to stand with sand, boiling water and other conditions, and it can lay dormant for several years until the ideal conditions for it to grow again. So this is how bacteria might be able to stay like in a can in canned food like um compromised can canned food and how they might infect you even years after so yeah obtaining nutrients bacteria obtain nutrients in two main ways they're either autotrophic meaning auto means self making their own food or photosynthesis photoautotrophs and unlike green plants bacteria do not release oxygen but instead release sulfur which isn't too healthy for us but um, the bacteria have their own way of doing things. So instead of oxygen, they release sulfur, unlike plants. Chemosynthesis, they use energy from inorganic compounds in the environment and build them into organic compounds. So they're chemoautotrophs, which means they do it themselves and it's through chemicals. 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus chemical energy in the form of, for example, iron or sulfur compounds instead of sunlight energy as seen in plants and then they can transform it into glucose and oxygen because they just need to be able to break the bonds in carbon dioxide and water and be able to form it into glucose as food so there's also heterotrophic meaning they cannot make their own food sapro there can be either saprophytic or parasitic yeah saprophytic or parasitic so these are saprophytes or decomposers and what they do is they um, they leach off the dead. They obtain food from dead inorganic waste, I mean organic waste, or um, just matter. And they have a, a wide range of enzymes to be able to be ready for any kind of waste they come across to digest and use as food. There are parasites, which obtain nutrients from currently living things, like plants and animals. And they are limited to what foods can be used. For example, if they live inside humans, they'd be limited to whatever food they can get from us. And they don't have the enzymes that saprophytic um, bacteria might because they would just use the food that has been pre-digested by the host. They remain very close to the host and they may cause diseases in the host, but not usually not the death of the host because that's to their disadvantage. They would die without their food source, but sometimes they may just cause diseases in the host uh, due to their infection and then they end up killing the host anyway. Um, once food is inside the bacteria, it will serve two purposes. It is either used as energy or used as building blocks. And the process of releasing energy is called respiration. There's anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. Anaerobic meaning respiration without the use of oxygen. So they rely on fermentation to produce, uh, to provide energy from organic nutrients. It's more primitive. And there's a bunch of different end products because they're not using oxygen. So from glucose, they need to turn this glucose back into energy. And since they're not using oxygen, they're only going to get two ATP out of it. And they're going to get a byproduct of lactic acid, which you might know about from your muscles. Ethanol, which is an uh, organic alcohol with carbon dioxide or acetic acid, which is vinegar and carbon dioxide. So this is how vinegar is made. Obligate anaerobes are kind of tricky. They're organisms that cannot tolerate the presence of oxygen at all obligate anaerobes so that means the respiration without the use of oxygen obligate means they must so they must not have oxygen for example i'm not going to pronounce that but they the the botulin it produces the um botulin disease botulism which is a food poisoning kind of like um paralysis it can happen in canned foods and they actually use it 
in Botox injections to make you make individuals stop wrinkling up because they won't be able to move that part of their face anymore. So aerobic respiration means using oxygen to break down nutrients into energy. So with oxygen, look, it's 38 ATP now and they produce carbon dioxide and six water, like how humans do it. And you get 19 times more energy. Obligate aerobes are oxygen organisms that cannot survive without oxygen and include many infectious bacteria. And this is the really annoying one. Facultative anaerobes are actually aerobes. Okay. But they're aerobes that can use fermentation in the absence of oxygen. So they have a little bit of both. But remember that they're called anaerobes and they're actually aerobes. Just remember that they have, just, just think of it as having all the capabilities. So that means they're able to do aerobic, which means they should be aerobes. But the fact that they can do fermentation means that they're also anaerobes. And that's why they're named anaerobes and they're facultative anaerobes. And that's it for bacteria.